Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tom Stewart here, and we're lucky to be joined today by our friend Matt Ricketts of Better Life Made, St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me, Tom. Hey, man, thanks for, for, for joining us. Uh, Liz is uh, taking the day off. She's uh, got uh, some, some balls in the air and said, go ahead, take the day off. Uh, Matt and I have this thing down called. This is just another day at the office, right, Matt? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to open up Facebook so I can do what Liz does and do the questions. So I'm going to try and find when the broadcast uh, shows up. I'm going to try and try and uh, find those for us, too. OK, yeah, that'll be helpful. Yeah. Um, we got some some updates uh, for you here in a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about what's happening in Washington with the. Uh, the House and the Senate both have uh, some legislation that uh, they're going to be dealing with this week that uh, could once again change the rules of how PPP is 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 used and, and handled. And yeah, um, that'll be be helpful and good news. Would have been nice yeah. that stuff six weeks ago, right? But that's okay, I guess. Uh, I know some of us. I guess it, I guess the first people that are that got their money are are in their sixth week. I think I'm in my fifth week of it right now. So. I mean, it would have been good to know some of that before, but we'll deal with it, right? You know, when they had that first tranche of money of like three sixty-five billion, and they blew through that, and then they allocated, I think it was another three hundred and twenty billion, and the concern was that was going to go really fast too, but yeah. it hasn't. They've still got about a hundred billion dollars in PPP funds that yeah. haven't been allocated, and people aren't applying anymore. So the from what I understand, and this is uh, so my bankers, you know, from from my bank, which is Midwest Bank Center, um, I have a, a local bank here. Um, we had uh, the average the average uh, lending amount for the uh, for the PPP went down significantly from round to round. So the second round, the average was forty three thousand. The first round was was like closer to like two hundred and eighty thousand. So um, a lot more smaller businesses um, were were able to take care of take care of business on the second round. So I think that's kind of what we're seeing there. Um, I think that's what we're seeing there as far as uh, why the money's lasting. It's truly small businesses are being able to take advantage of that, which is is kind of a cool thing. But it, it makes you wonder if they've got like a hundred billion, and actually, there's more people giving the money back or just not closing on the loan. So even the monies that are out there, they're thinking that a lot of that's going to be coming back unused for a lot of different reasons. There's, there's articles where banks are just talking about the confusion and people are afraid to use the money and the rules are unclear. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of contributing factors that are, that are equating to, to those funds, not, uh, not being fully utilized. Yeah. I think, I think we're going to see, I mean, um, there were, there's some good faith certifications that like some of the larger businesses they're going to have to go through are, you know, uh, that are going to make it uh, a little bit uglier for some businesses that were planning on using the money a little bit, uh, um, you know, I didn't necessarily need, like one of the, one of the ones that really stood out the most to me wasn't the big restaurant change. It was the change. It was the Lakers. Did you read that the Lakers, uh, yeah, that one stood out. They up. scored a ton of money. That was that seemed very abusive to me. Where it's just like, come on, that's a franchise that just you can sell hats through this and, and get through this. You can sell merchandise, like you don't, you know. And, and people are going to still watch the games on TV. You still have contracts for TV rights. Yeah, you're hurting on some stadium money, and I don't know how much of I don't know how much of their revenue is hurt. But I was like, I was like, really. The Lakers, like that's a trivial amount of money given their overall budget. I mean, right. salaries are capped at a hundred thousand a year, so I mean they're not paying player salaries out of that. Well, so. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was back office staff and things like that, but it's still it's still an absurd um, it's still an absurdity when like you know pro sport again. You know, I, I am happy to see the smaller businesses being able to take advantage of it. And I'm, I'm happy that it didn't run through like, like it did the second time, you know, hindsight being 2020, I would have liked a couple more weeks to have, uh, you know, you know, you know, gotten the money and been better prepared to, you know, have a smoother start. But 
Um, you know, we've been we've been open now since uh, I believe April 27th, coming up on um, you know reopen uh, coming up on a month now, and uh, I think the first week we were just doing training, so I think we're not quite a full month of actual cleaning, but. Um, yeah, it's worked out. Um, it's worked out the way that I think it's supposed to work out. I think we're, it helped us get back on our feet. It's helped us grow our cash position, but I don't, I don't look at that as, Oh, that helped us out. I mean, I spent $60,000 to wind down my business basically at my size with, you know, payroll, um, you know, uh, things that I owed people that I needed to pay. So it's, it's helping me get back my cash position to where it was pre COVID and maybe a little bit better. Uh, so that I have a cushion again if this goes sideways again. And um, you have some thoughts on whether or not we're going to see some, you know, maybe some fits and starts with this recovery. So, you know, I, I think we should be encouraging people to to build up their war chests um, just in case. Yeah, I mean, you know, part of our jobs as, you know, running our business as being CEOs is strategy and anticipating you know, what are the risks, the typical SWOT analysis thinking. And, you know, we know that there's a ton of money floating around out there that, you know, the, the federal government's pushed out. A lot of it's going to dry up in, towards the towards the end of July, as it stands now with, with like all the employment benefits. There's uh, some, some economists out there that are thinking that, that we're going to fall off of, the economy is going to fall off a lot in August just because there's not going to be as much spending because all of the uh, unemployment uh, benefits are going away. And once you get into September, you got local and, and state governments are going through a budgeting cycle and, you know, their finances, their coffers have been torn apart with all of this as well. And the thinking is there's going to be a lot of layoffs there, like the airline industry and some of the larger industries had, uh, pretty uh pretty significant bailouts of their own that required yeah. them to keep people on staff for a period of time i mean you probably still have friends that are pilots and yeah i can't remember the dates but i'm thinking it's till october and then september everyone i believe sometime in september maybe it's october but the airlines are very open and saying soon as they hit that date where they can legally let people go they're going to have to let a whole bunch of people go so so one thing yeah so agreed so that's so that's a sector that's going to be um that's going to be hurting for a while and so what i would suggest is is that you're not going to see actually prices go lower on like at first they were freaking out they're just selling stuff to you know get butts in the seat what's what's going to happen is they're going to right size the the demand and um it, you know it's going to be probably twice as expensive as it was before to do air travel because there's going to be less seats you know less seats available but there are going to be some 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 significant uh reshuffling um, what one of the bigger problems is because uh, the workforce has uh, they, they there were some rules that allowed the workforce to change age um, from retirement mandatory retirement at 60 to 65 for pilots. Um, there's going to be some right sizing right now because that that rule is kind of like kind of hitting the point where a lot of those guys that were 60 that were grandfathered in that rule are turning 65 now. There's they're going to be able to do some of that with retirements, but it's going to be it's going to be rough now. You're going to be seeing that across all, all all industries, though. Every industry is going to take this as an opportunity. I mean, this is, I mean, you see that in any recession, businesses say, okay, we have to downsize, right size, whatever. I this isn't going to be any different. It's just going to be layered over top of what's happening to hospitality and restaurants and travel. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, there's, you know, I don't, I haven't read many people. Most people believe that we're still going to be in double digit unemployment going into 2021. So those are good opportunities though for a business like ours. I started my, my business in a, in a recession. And what I, what I tell people is it's a great opportunity to build up an incredible team. So here's the thing, um, I can't really see, let me see if I can turn my board here. You can see this board with pictures, it's looking pretty empty. And I'm, we still have about three more people to put up, but that board's usually full. Right now there's 23 people on it. We've got three people we don't have pictures up for right now. And then another three coming back. So we have 25 to 26 technicians um, right now with some more coming back. Normally we'd have closer to 40. So we're, we're looking to, and I've got a stack of some more people over here that are going on uh, FFCRA. So I've got, you know, more faces like, 
turn into the picture so I can get them in there. <laughs> now we've got another stack of people that need to go on FFCRA because they don't have child care. Um, so we have, you know, uh, an opportunity to kind of rebuild our staffing, though, the way we want it. It, it. We're actually to the point now where we are at a, a pretty good supply and demand level with the staff that we have and actually have more demand than staff. So we're actually hiring. So I have... Um, I have five people scheduled to start next week. And if three of them show up, that'd be great. If two of them show up, that'd be great. I, I don't know who's going to really show up. We've, we've interviewed them, you know, via, via uh, Google uh, meetup or meets. Um, you know, we've done, we're requiring them to do all their paperwork and all their onboarding before they show up. Um, but man, my, my uh, HR person was out last week and I did a lot of interviews. There were a lot of good, a lot of good candidates. I mean, I talked to some people that I wanted to get off the, the meeting with pretty quick. But I, I talked to um, a lot of good candidates. She hired two more people today. She's back in the office uh, today. She did uh, she did a lot of interviews, and two of them turned out really well. And you know, I'm I'm hoping we can build a pretty rock solid staff out of this. I don't know about you, but we're we're in full on hiring mode. I plan on hiring. Yeah, we people. are as well. We you know we had a meeting this morning. We're supply constrained. You know we have. We have revenue that we can't put on the board right now just because we don't have the labor to do it. Yeah, that's where that's where we're at. Like we're we're like hoping for cancellation. I think um, I, I have to pull up Made Central, but uh, I I think we have revenue of like I pull up. Uh, it doesn't matter, but it's you know um, normal day for us pre COVID was probably you know nine thousand dollars a day. You know, so whatever interpolate that out to whatever your numbers are. Um, this week we're doing you know, 5,000, Tuesday, 5,400, 5,500. So not, not crazy busy, but next week we've already, we've already contacted most of our customers for next week. And I think we're looking at like six or $7,000 a day. We don't have the labor, we don't have the labor for it. So like, um, um, Are you finding, we've got a lot of people are saying we want to start up in June. For some reason, June seems to be a, a mile. Yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking at Monday. We have 72, 59, 91 on the board, 68, 22, 73, 16, 8,000 on Thursday, though I don't think we've sent out reminders yet for Thursday. And Friday still has 7,800 on it. But Monday being at 7,200 after we've already sent out, um, we, we've sent out reminders and called everyone. We're, call, we're calling every customer right now still confirming every appointment because we don't want to be wasting any labor resources that we have driving to properties where, where we're surprising them. So um, I think that's a real number. We don't have enough labor to do that. Even at um, guessing, I, I think we normally shoot for about 280 to 300 per person per day. We're not holding to the, holding our staff to that standard right now because it's just, it just, it's you know hard with all the new processes, but times 25 people we're that's more than we can do 7,000 is kind of our cap right now with our current staff so we we need people we've got a few comments coming in here Sarah Mitchell was commenting earlier on when we were talking about the the forgiveness window that uh, six, six weeks uh, would have been nice I guess that was getting a little more heads up we're going to talk here in a little bit though we all might have uh, a bigger window than, than yeah. what we uh, initially thought with the eight weeks yeah. Karen, Karen Coy uh, says she's got mine. Karen, is that your PPP or is that your, your idle monies? Um, she also thinks that uh, the Lakers should have enough money where they don't need any uh, well, PPP. Think about money. Some investors and like dude, any, any business that has access to like to the capital market should not, should have been withheld from this money because you know how hard it is as a small business. Nobody wants to give us money. This was like, this is, this is like a unicorn event. I mean, like in all the years I've been doing business, like I, I had struggled sometimes to set up a $30,000 line of credit with, with us bank. And when I switched to my new bank, that was like, they were happy to do it. But I mean, the amount of paperwork that it took to get $30,000, it was like a book. Um, you know, when this all started and I was just like, I was in like, you know, digging for every dollar mode of where I could find money. Um, I mean, I had to like, I had to dig through every piece of paperwork that they wanted and, it was quite intensive. And then it's funny for them just to drop $150,000 in my bank account based on this streamlined one page application with no documentation. It was, 
that's crazy. And I know some people were getting five hundred thousand dollars that got the money earlier than me. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. there's some thought. There's some thought that you know, depending on if more monies are allocated, that we can go back and ask for more. I don't necessarily need it unless I see the opportunity to purchase a building if that could be used for that. Um, you know, and some of the legislation that's out there now is laxing even the PPP funds in terms of being able to invest it in different ways to make the business stronger. It looks like at they're throwing a lot of the, the rules out the window. We'll get to that in a minute. Danit yeah. is with us. She's a regular. Hey, how you doing? Uh, Karen says that, yes, it was PPP funds that, that she got. That's great. And you might be able to do a lot more with that and different things than, than what we thought with, with some of the, the, the changes that are being proposed. Robin Murphy is with us. Hey, Robin, how are you? And she says that she's got four regular customers coming back tomorrow that hasn't been, haven't been clean since March. Um, we're, we're dealing with that too, Robin. I think you're going to, you got to roll with it. Like we've, do however you think is best, but we're, we're trying to be accommodating and trying to let them know that we're not going to be able to get it all caught up on that first visit and just, and you know, Robin's business is just North of uh, New York city and really a suburb of, of New York. And um, wow, that's, that's awesome because I imagine, you know, it's kind of the epicenter of the whole COVID thing here for the last uh, X number of weeks. So yeah, having, that's, a, that's a really good sign. Yeah, I'm excited for I'm excited for everyone that's getting back on their feet. I know um, I have a friend that has a business in Philadelphia. They've been shut down for a while, um, and they're kind of getting getting geared back up. And um, another friend in Jersey City, and she is uh, she is starting the process of getting her business world back up. But again, we have to remember this is so different for different parts of the country, and so they were hit so hard that the mentality of the consumer is probably very different too than what we're, um, you know, St. Louis is, you know, major, what, I don't know if you call it major metro, large metro. Um, we, we've we had a lot of cases in the city and county, but a lot of ours have been in um, nursing homes and kind of, especially in kind of uh, lower income nursing homes and things like that. Unfortunately, um, I think about 70% of our cases um, have been um, have been in elderly populations. We did not do a good job protecting those populations in St. Louis for whatever reason. They were hit pretty hard. Yeah, um, and it looks like a lot of the deaths are living communities. And yeah, that's, uh, I think it was particularly high. I think it was particularly high here. I think nationwide it's close to fifty percent, and it was a little bit higher, a little bit higher here for whatever. I mean, it doesn't look like it. We have a really good plan to address that yet either. No, I don't know that. I, I know, you know, initially my sales plan was to go back after those places when this was kind of like hit, like when this was all hitting and like, and I was like, oh, I'm going to really market to these uh, um, assisted living facilities and to uh, these residential communities for older adults. And now I'm like, man, I don't know if I want that liability. That's another thing that hasn't really been very well addressed yet. I've had some conversations with my insurance broker and there's, there's some, there's some gray area that I think probably we need. We need. Well, there, need there's some interesting things happening. Venture capital has made their way into plaintiffs' attorney law firms. Oh, so good. there's a whole you know group of, of attorneys out there, law firms that have more money they know what to do with just to go after this type of, of litigation. So. Um, yeah, I was talking to my agent about that a few weeks ago, and he says they're expecting just a ton of it, and people are getting sued for things that you'd never imagine you could get sued for just because the money's there to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's a frick. It's 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 a virus. It's an act of God. It's beyond it's beyond any control of you know you know is if, if you're making good you know good practices, you'd think you know. You're, you know, you're making solid business decisions based on, you know, what consumers want and, and their decisions. But that is a concern. I'm, I'm hopeful there is some legislation that protects businesses. Um, it's, it's certainly being discussed. It's yeah. certainly being discussed. It's it needs to yeah. probably be addressed. And I think, um, you know, if there was something, if, if there's any ARCSI board members on the call, that might be something where we're, I know they're working on some legislation on um, trying to uh, get some tax credits for businesses to restart. Um, and that would benefit us all as cleaning companies to kind of get in and help, 
you know, clean some of these small businesses and do some more additional cleaning for, uh, um, for them during the restart. Um, but I think that might be something to focus on legislatively would be, you know, protecting our members. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm a member of Aerosis. I, I don't speak for it. So, um, right. you know, but I think that would be something that would be, uh, I, I would push for if I, if I had any say. Here's Heather Day's telling us that she's 30 minutes from Philly. What a process to regroup and find a new normal. Yeah. Or even maybe, maybe the minutes. new abnormal. <laughs> right. I mean, even 30 minutes, like, right. The suburbs should be like, you know, probably vastly different um, than, you know, uh, there's, so where mm -hmm. I, where St. Louis, where I'm at, there's quite a few um, counties that kind of make up the region. There's St. Louis city County, there's St. Louis County, there's St. Charles County, where um, one of our long-term friends, um, um, Marvelous Maids, Kathy Gage, who sold it to Blue Skies a few years back. But uh, that's a that's one uh, county over about 15 miles from my office. Vastly different statistics out there. Vastly different um, the, the way things have progressed out there. And almost all of their cases have been in nursing homes. Not a whole lot of, you know, uh, public spread and things like that. Uh, just... Uh, um, you know, in general. So it's just, everywhere's a little different. I mean, we all have to kind of take this, you know, we have to take it seriously wherever we're at and we have to take a lot of precautions, but um, man, I think those big cities though, like Philly, New York, um, it's just the mentality of people coming back. I think it's going to be a different, um, it's just, you're going to have to really sell them on, on all your processes and, and the way you're doing things very professionally coming back. Rob and uh, Stevenson's got a question for us. He wants to know if we could discuss uh, full-time equivalent reductions with employees not coming back to work and loan forgiveness in the in the PPP program. Yeah. Is this a topic for today? Yeah. I mean, I can cover a lot. Of, like, I actually have a pretty good, just a pretty good just summary of this. Um, there's, there's two ways to calculate your FTEs. I think the easier way is to calculate anyone that makes less than 40 hours as as a 0.5 uh, I, did you look at that i thought that was a great that was actually like really very simplified because very few of my employees would actually count as ftes as 40 probably um out of you know 40 that were on this board before probably um gosh i don't know like 15 of them would actually be technically ftes everyone else would be a 0.5 so my total for the calculation is much easier when i when i just use that 0.5 calculation uh, for employees that don't come back, uh, that, that refuse work or that go on, I showed you that stack of people on people that are going to go on FFCRA, uh, they, they will count towards your uh, FTEs for uh, forgiveness. So, so like whatever you had before and after, they'll count for that. And you don't get hit against those for your reduction in wages because they made a choice. They, they made a choice not to, to be reduced. And the reduction in wages is is based on individual employees. Every single individual is looked at as a so as a most, most of most of your your cleaning technicians, I guess, are being counted as 0.5. 0.5. Like yeah, most. but that was like before yeah, yeah. COVID and Sorry, after you, you, COVID. So I mean, it kind of balances out. Yeah, I, I think that. So that was kind of like that was kind of nice to to see that the formula instead of having to do that, like you you can still do it the more complicated way where you go and look at like. All right. If they're 32 hours, they're a 0.8. If they're 30 hours, they're whatever. For me, it was just like, oh, this 0.5 is great. Like this is super simple. Um, it's a little easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, they really made it clear that you're not going to be hurt for those. I mean, I've got three or four now. Um, I, I just sent a, a message to one that I'm like, I need you to come back by next week, or we're going to stop paying you through. <laughs> it's really working to your favor, right? Because if before all this, somebody was averaging say 30 hours a week and after this, if they're averaging 20, they both count as 0.5. And that's, and that's an interesting point too. Exactly. And so we're, we are, but, but, but you could, you could argue though that they, you don't want to reduce them more than 25% because that would actually be counted against you in the actual physical calculation. I've reduced everyone by 20%. Um, for for the first few weeks of this, we go back to full time work next week. We've been on this work share program, and arguably it was working out well until the, the demand just started to shoot up this last week. Um, and then next week, it's just it's above what we can actually service. So 
Robin's asking is full time 30 or 40 and Marlo's already answered it's 40. So basically you're either full time, you're either you're either at a hundred or, yeah. or fifty. There's no real there's no ben I don't think there's any real benefit to to doing the calculated way where you do it like at intense because so few of our employees actually hit 40 hours every single week on the dial. Anybody that averages less than 40 hours is 8.5, and you can count them that way. That's a great I, calculation. I would think in, in most cases, this new formula, simplified formula, works to our favor. I agree, and I, I think that that's – I need to sit down and go through the final rules that came out this week. Um, uh, my bank has been really good about having um, – you know, a weekly speaker from um, a, a local accounting firm. So I would see if your bank has any resources on that um, as far as if they're doing any, uh, not, not a podcast, but a, but a, something like this, um, a, a live seminar of, of some kind. But you know, they're not the final rules. They're being, I forget the terminology they use. It's the most current interim rules, the final interim rules. They're saying it in a way it's like, this is the rules as they are now, but you know, don't blame us if they change again next week. Every time my bank puts something out, it always has a, this is the most current information as of May 27. They put the date on every single, they're putting the date on every single thing that they're doing because like this could literally be outdated in a week. Let me, let me share something here because this has a, has a bearing on all of this. We, we touched upon this yesterday, but I found a little more information on it. This was, uh, you know, Steny Hoyer, the uh, House uh, Majority Leader, who is saying that tomorrow uh, they're going to be putting a bill uh, in front of the House to vote on, which will do several things. It will extend the eight week. I'm going to put drop this in the link too. Uh, it's going to extend the eight week forgiveness window to 24 weeks. Uh, or December 31st, whichever comes first. It will let businesses repay loans over five years instead of two. So this is a five-year loan now, or would be if, if this becomes law at 1% interest. Um, it scraps the rule that no more than 25% of the proceeds can be spent on expenses. Um, the Senate has a similar measure that it's looking to to uh, vote on, which will extend the deadline to apply for the loan from June 30. Um, and it will double the current eight week period. So I guess they were, the, the, the sentence version would go from eight to 16 weeks. Okay. And um, there's some other stuff here about being more liberal in the Senate bill in terms of how they can spend the how we can spend the monies as well. It'd be nice if they drop more money out there for us to to reapply for to keep our keep our people paid through that. But that would be on top of everything. One one thing I do want to address, and I think people need to realize, is um, it, it really is going to be hard to get full forgiveness on this loan, and you're going to have some. If you if you're paying people not to work like I was for a couple of weeks while we were training them and you know we're we've got some people that are on your on my payroll that aren't working yet which is I'm, I'm ending next week as we bring everyone back to full time um, you're still paying the payroll taxes and things like that and I'm using I think we've all known that from the beginning but I'm spending that down from my you know from my PPP funds and out of my twenty five thousand dollars a weekly payroll right now five thousand won't be forgiven because it's going to be taxes some of that state too. So it won't be quite the 5,000, but I'm still based on, based on what we know now. Yeah. <laughs> True. But I'm still on the hook for a few thousand dollars for the payroll every week. So you don't want to go crazy and just be paying people to do nothing because you're still going to have some expenses of that. You've got your federal tax portion. That's always been your responsibility, your, your FICA, um, any, any other, um, any other taxes that are your responsibility and the money that's been deducted from their check already you're paying that with you know with their money and it's being deducted from that you know from those from those funds um so it's you know it, it was never your money to begin with right so you're, you're about 15 percent of your payroll is going to be um money you're going to have to pay back um anyway as far as i'm concerned and 
that that's not such a big deal. But if you are doing anything irrational because your business isn't in an area where you can open right away yet, you might want to think about that too. Yeah, but it doesn't, so much of this doesn't really affect the decisions you're going to be making running your business. You're not going to, you're not going to not hire somebody or clean a house because your workers comp insurance isn't going to be forgiven under PPP. It's right. we're, we're fretting over, well, gee, I, you know, I'm getting a lot, but I want more. I know. I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking our, our, but our if you're not, if you're not generating energy, revenue, energy, energy focus is better spent managing our business in a logical way rather than spending a whole lot of time. That's why you know, I don't spend a lot of time doing all these calculations in terms of how much is going to be forgiven. I mean, I want to clean homes. I want to, I want to hire people. I want to hire, you know, people that, 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 that we want to have an organization or to bring our people back that, that work for us if, if, if that works. And the PPP is going to take care of itself. I agree. You know? In, so our in, friend Joe Walsh puts it really well. He makes rational dis business decisions and like he feels like some of this, right, has led to some irrational choices in the way that people are choosing to spend money and do things. Um, I do think as as we get towards the end of the money, like you do, you definitely need to right size your business for where you are at. I mean, I do know that I have some some tougher calls with with some some management spending. I don't know that I have enough revenue uh, to cover to cover my current management structure. Um, if we don't get back to 80%, which we're, we're going to be close, but um, I don't want to be spending through the war chest that I built up um, unless that I can see that we're trending, unless that I can see that we're trending that way that we might get to 90%, you know, in the short term. But I'm also concerned that we are going to have some ups and downs and that, that, you know, people are going to freak out again and not want service for a few weeks. And, you know, that this is going to be fits and starts, you know? Yeah. But it's going to be in so many different directions. You know, I haven't used the term unprecedented event yet. So I'm not contractually today. obligated to fit that in. So we can go ahead and check that off the list. But it is, this is an unprecedented event. And you know, the economy is going to look weird, you know, in the months ahead. Can't predict how, but it's not going to be the normal as we know it, the unemployment rate is going to be high. There's going to be opportunity. There's going to be challenges, but at the same time, there's going to be surprises. Like what we did, this article that we're, we're looking at here, they're talking about taking a two year loan, turning it into a five year loan and allowing us to use it for things that we didn't think that we could use it on, yeah. you know, when we first got it. And they're not done yet, folks. I mean, yeah, five, five years is a big difference on the amortization schedule of a two-year loan, too. I mean, just that that drops this down. Whatever you have left, if you have fifty thousand dollars left, you might actually rationally keep that money on a five-year loan. That's like you know six hundred bucks a month, seven hundred bucks a month at one percent interest. I mean, that might be that might make a rational decision to keep that money because it might be you could purchase a couple of vehicles or something rational. Like you could actually do some um, you know equipment purchases with lower interest than you would you know pay you know, than you would pay. On the and, free we, and we don't know what they yeah. eventually. It seems like that they're getting more and more lax and more and more giving us more and more options before it's over with. They might say that we can re refinance existing debt with with this money. I'm making that up. I don't know, but it certainly is something within the the realm of consideration. If you could argue that that's going to make us more solvent and and create a better chance for us to be in business. Did well, you? Did you um, did you cover uh, earlier this week? I know the CDC had initially put out some changes on its website that kind of got the news media to kind of pick up on the idea that that the cleaning and sanitation weren't going to be as important, and then they had to kind of yeah. We shared, we shared that yesterday and put that link actually on the resource page. We we can look at that again at the end. I the one the one that that we I gave you earlier today. Yeah, yeah we, we went through all of that. But to finish the previous thought, because I think this is really, really important. Um, if this whole if this whole COVID-19 thing is a baseball game, we're like in the second inning. And every piece of news that comes out, we act like, well, that's the definitive answer to all of this. And we know what the world is going to be like from this point forward. And we don't have a clue. There's challenges ahead and there's opportunities ahead you know there's you know 
there's going to be fewer cleaning businesses in, in, in the industry. I mean, I get contacted by, by people on a daily basis that are looking to get out and do something else for, for very, you know, various reasons, a lot of them logical. And for a lot of other businesses that are in this, you know, for, 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 for the long haul, those are opportunities, right? And we don't know from an infection control standpoint, you know, like you were mentioning the CDC, and maybe that's where the tie-in is, where they came out with the guidance uh, yesterday or day before yesterday saying, hey, 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 don't stop washing your hands and cleaning your high-touch surfaces. That's still really important, yeah. too. Um, you know, how, how the yeah. world looks at cleaning is, is going to be real. And I know you bought some equipment to uh, allow you to play that game in a different way. Yeah, so we have a couple things. So we we do have some of these victory sprayers that have been coming in and trying to figure out how to monetize this thing. This thing is really big. Um, you know, this is one option that we have. These actually do a pretty good job. It's got an adjustable nozzle, electrostatic, so that it supposedly wraps around surfaces. I, I have thought that the spraying is a little hokey, so I'm a little, um, I'm not going to be going into residential with this so much. Um, but we have a lot of commercial properties, apartment commons, things like that, where I think this is a credibility piece. I'm going to do some photo shoots with it. Up till now, we've been just using um, some of these paint sprayers. These are really low cost options to kind of get into spraying. And these put out um, small enough particles to, to spray with. I think they're like 15 to 20 microns. Again, this is not cordless. This has to be plugged in. Um, but, uh, we've been using these in some commercial spaces to do some really high volume disinfection of a lot of services. Like we have an apartment complex that has this like railing all the way down the hallway. And, you know, like it would be a little onerous to spray and wipe it. Uh, with this, we've just been laying down like the, the spray and then it really hasn't been leaving any residue. We've been using, um, a kind of a, a tablet, uh, style, um, they're, a non-chlorine bleach tablet called uh, either brew tab or green clean. It's the same chemical either way. Actually, all those tabs are typically the same chemical. There's like pure tabs, green clean. They're actually all, all of their SDSs are exactly the same. They are the same product. Um, they're just, they're just in different um, volumes and, you know, size tablets and things like that. But we've been doing this. Um, it can leave some spotting. So you have to be, you have to be careful about, you know, what you're going to use it on. Um, but so Robin, Robin Murphy's uh, commenting here that they're using the victory sprayers in homes and their clients they're in homes and their clients love it. Okay. I've talked to Robin a lot off to the side. We uh, share some common interests in terms of uh, site created, uh, you know, re-engineered water. And she does a lot with hyperchlorous acid and, and actually, you know, brews a lot of, of, of her cleaning products. It's, I would, uh, I would really love to do a whole day of just talking about that. You should have her on. I'd like to learn more about, uh, I, I'd like to get an onsite generator for my business. I, I, I can see, I can see that becoming more and more pervasive, yeah. I mean, especially now that, that, that we're aware that, yeah, hygienic cleaning matters. Do the, do the math. I mean, your size business, my size business, you know, an onsite generator can go from 5,000 to 15,000 or more, maybe 30,000 bytes to buy something high volume. That doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense. Um, unless you're doing a lot of volume, but like, let's say in the middle, 15,000, that's one year of, that's one year of cleaning solutions for, for my company, you know, so, cause we're, we're in a centralized location. You're, you have multiple locations so that doesn't necessarily work as easily, but we have one central location doing, you know, doing, you know, back in the good old days, a few months ago, doing, you know, 60 houses a day. So, you know, that's, that would be a really a cost saver. I'd love to, um, love Robin, to hear. Robin says, "Do it." You know, I'm. I, I'll, I'll, I'll pick. I'll, I'll pick my words carefully here, but you know, you. A lot of the major manufacturers of cleaning products make their money off of stuff that goes in a trash can or goes down a drain. Right. And anything that is, you know, generated on site that's sustainable that way, you know, the traditional cleaning chemicals have 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 a lobby. They have a lot of financial backing and a lot of uh, big companies promoting it. You don't have a lot of advocacy on the side of of, you know, taking you know, water out of the tap and, and salt and applying some electricity to it and making a uh, 
a sanitizer that is, is, is efficacious. So we're not doing it. The reason that you don't see a lot of it isn't because it's rational, isn't because the science isn't there. There's a mountain of scientific evidence that it's efficacious. It's just there's no body advocating for it because, you know, companies don't make much money selling. No, they're probably right. You're right. Like, so what, so, so basically once, once they sell you the machine, I mean, like basically you're just buying, you know, like, like high end salt basically for some of these, for some of these OSGs on site generators. So I think it's a great way. It's a great way to go. I think um, most of us that are building, you know, building businesses that have gotten to a certain size. And I don't know what that number is. It depends on the size of how, what the equipment costs for this, this is, but again, like I look at my costs, if I if I were to put in a high end, high volume machine, one year payoff on it, I think would would really make it make a lot of sense. I mean, my on site lot, my on site laundry um, made a lot of sense just from the fact of uh, you know just you know we were using residential machines before, and then when those would break, we were driving over to like you know laundry mats. You know, just upping your game to more expensive equipment sometimes pays off. It doesn't always. It doesn't always go to be cheap, right? So. And Mark, you're. I mean, Matt, you're one of the best I've I've seen from a branding standpoint and telling a story standpoint. And you know, not only not only is it just the cost of you know trading off between a piece of equipment versus the chemicals, but it's the most sustainable way you can go. You've got uh, the smallest carbon footprint. You know, there's no shipping. There's no boxes. There's no waste. Um, it is, it is green, you know, I, 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 like, I like, definitely like to, I think that could be a good story right now. There's so much waste though, like in our business, like with these gloves and, you know, like shoe covers and that's unfortunate. Um, there's not really what I see as like a, a really, um, yeah, but I think you're right. I think there's a but story. It, it, it's, 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 it's efficacious. It's true hygienic cleaning. I mean, yeah. you've, you're, you're actually sanitizing surfaces, um, you can make a disinfectant if you, you know, apply the the, the right amount. If you, you, you can, you can, you, you got a spectrum of product that, that, that you can make if you want to go down that path yeah. and it's safe, you know, from a, from a environment. It's not like taking EPA controlled pesticides basically and exposing consumers to it, exposing your workforce to it eight hours a day. It's, Okay, I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm going too far. I think it's exciting, but that's a good way. We're talking about investments into our future today, kind of like you know, kind of future thinking a little bit. I think that that's kind of, uh, an area where you might think about where you ha you have some more money and resources than you've had in, in the past. Um, you know, I've always thought it was a good rule of thumb to have three weeks of payroll in the bank, and I, and I, after this, I'm like, man, that doesn't even feel like it because I, I never thought my business would ever shut down completely. I'm like, three weeks of payroll. That's so much money. It's crazy to keep that much money sitting around. And anyway, you know, because, you know, anything more than that, I would want to spend and invest and do some other things with. Um, right now, most of us have probably more than three weeks payroll sitting in the bank. We have the PPP funds. We have money that's been building back up, building our war chests up. I would definitely suggest keeping, you know, a strong um, a strong rule of thumb of some kind that you're going to stick to is what you need to keep as cash on hand. But I think it's a good time to make some investments like this that that could pay down, you know, your your operating costs over time. Um, yeah, I, I think that would be, you know, an excellent idea. Any other ideas like that? If anyone else is sharing, Sarah Mitchell had a, had a point where this is back to the PPP a little bit. Um, she's talking about she's going to be running low on on her PP, PPP funds here, and she's not sure what she's going to do. Uh, she's not back to like the right size business for her whole management team, which is kind of the same situation I'm in. So yeah, Sarah, we're going to have to make some some tough calls. Um, what I what I'm doing, and just for your own benefit, is I'm keeping all of my managers until through July um, part time on what's called Workshare in Missouri. So they're actually all my managers, including myself and my wife, actually too, because we're man we're in the same category in our business. Uh, there's six of us total. Um, are going to be on work share. So we're all getting paid less than we got paid before, 32 hours per week equivalent. Uh, but then we we get Missouri unemployment plus the federal funds till they run out. And then after that, we're going to have to make some tough calls as to, so I'm, I'm kind of extending that out of my office a little bit with uh, by putting everyone on part-time for the immediate future. And I'm not advocating the idea, but if you have idle monies, you, that you can use that for for payroll as well. 
That's what it's for. I mean, if you need to, and, and there's a good reason to think that that's a good investment to keep your business, you know, keep you need to think about it as an investment though. If it's a matter of, if I spend these monies now to keep this key person because I've got good reason to believe my revenue is going to be at a point at, you know, on this date on the calendar where I can cash flow and pay that person out of my, my, you know, income as opposed to, to borrowing money to do it, then yeah, I mean, it's exactly what it's for. Yeah. But you don't want to burn that money week after week after week if there's no- If it's one, if it's one person, if it's one person and it's six to, six to $800 per week, right? The average average entry level manager in our industry is between 15 to $20 an hour. If they're a higher level manager, maybe $25 an hour, that's probably someone you were gonna keep anyway. It's probably one of your lower entry level managers that you're thinking about letting go. Um, you're right. I mean, it's six hundred dollars a week. You could probably burn through twelve weeks figuring that out. Only burn through twenty grand. Only right. But <laughs> but you remember when that seemed to be seemed like a lot of money, right? But it's amortized again out over a long period of time. If you have gotten the IDL funds, the idle funds is you know uh, the the acronym is quite easier to say. Um, the the math could make sense on that. I, I could be I could be persuaded. You could also make the, the 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 call that it might be an opportunity that if you do need to right size your business and you think there might be some better people out there for management, you could you could play roulette and you know take a chance and see who else is out there and and let somebody that was mediocre go. I'm not saying that's the case for you, Sarah. That might not. You, it sounds like you've built a great team from some side conversations that I've had with you. So. Um, you probably don't want to do that, but I think I think part of the decision making process would be, you know, just doing the doing the calculus. If you let that person go, how does that impact your business? Does your revenue start sliding back at that point? Can you hold your same level of revenue by letting that person go? Can you still grow your business without that person? I mean, you know, I know a number of people on, on some of these calls, of, you know, buy into the profit first approach and I yeah. think I think for, for a lot of businesses it's a it's a it's a, a worthwhile and logical way to approach it. And you know, the whole thinking is, you know, don't spend money you don't have. But this is an unprecedented event. It's like a natural disaster. Under certain circumstances, it makes sense to borrow money to save somebody if that's a short term deal to get you the long term profits. Yeah, if you're just bridging a gap if you're bridging a gap and you can see the you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, I could maybe make the maybe make the call to do that. I think um, so for me, again, the way that I've rationalized it is I'm putting all my managers on part time. So everyone's going to share equally in the burden a little bit. But for a little while, they're actually going to be making a little extra money with the federal unemployment for a little bit longer. So you could look and see if you have work share available for your management and you could you could partially lay off all of your managers by 20 to 40 percent um, once your EIDL money runs out. And I think that with the additional federal funds till the end of July, um, that you would be, you'd be able to have a little bit more time. What I found last week was, is that my HR person was out and, uh, I was working pretty hard. I, I would have a hard time replacing what she's doing. So we were doing, you know, we're on average doing about five interviews a day, uh, via Google meet. And, um, it's hard. I mean, she has a hard job, but that's, you know, five interviews a day doesn't sound like a lot, but there's other HR stuff that she's doing on top of that five people giving them 45 minutes and then taking notes on each one of them and then processing them through a, you know, a matrix of decision of whether you're going to hire them. It's about an hour a person basically by the time you do it, like that's a big chunk of her day. I didn't like it. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't personally want to go back to doing that again. Um, and I remember when I was doing three or four, three or four a day back when we were smaller and I, that was kind of one of my roles and I thought I was pretty good at it. I was like, when I did it last week, I was like, Oh man, this you probably is weren't taking an hour a person though. No, and she may not be either. I may be exaggerating that, but uh, you know, maybe it's thirty minutes a person. But there's some processing time that goes into that. You probably to... some people you take maybe five minutes with. <laughs> yes, I was a couple that I was like, I can't get off fast enough. But I give everyone like the same sheet of questions. Mm -hmm. I give everyone the same benefit of the doubt, even if just because I don't want to be like making any first you know, rash impression that's not true. So it's, um, yeah, there are people you're like, can we get this over with very quickly? Um, yeah, that, that's, you know, 
Oh, one other thing we found though, with uh, with kind of doing all this, we're not seeing anyone until the first day after we're, we're doing these these uh, these Google Meets and we're hiring these people. We're assigning them all of their paperwork and all their training to basically assess whether they're going to show up and do their job. It's actually been wonderful because we can actually already identify the people that aren't going to show up on the first day because they haven't done the work they're supposed to do. You know, and we've offered to pay them four hours of pay for that work if they show up and do the, the work on the first day. But we're actually identifying so many people that are just they're not going to work because they're not actually doing the the pre work to to get started. So that's been kind of a cool thing. That's that's something we'll stick with probably past this. So Google Meets, is that a good platform? Is that working for you? It's OK. It's because we have it. We, we have G Suite for um, our email. And so it's included in our pricing, um, you know, five dollars per user per month. Everybody has it. I will say um, that a lot of big corporations were using it before Zoom, but Zoom really like is much more stable, better visual, you know, better. Google just seems like it's like another half baked Google product, which, you know, kind of par for the course for Google. It's it's good enough. I haven't, I haven't looked at Zoom in a while for this application, but I remember <clears throat> being somewhat problematic because the candidate the job candidate needed to have some client side some client side app on their phone in order to make it work yeah you still need an app for google meet you don't need one for you don't need one for if they're on their on their computer but they do need to download the google meet app for um but same thing for pretty much all of them they're all being all of them yeah but so that seems to be a problem for, for a lot of people, just the technology and just. I don't know. I mean, we use so, me and you use so much technology in our businesses. It's kind of weeding out people that probably like that probably wouldn't be candidates anyway, because if they can't run a smartphone, I mean, you know, they can't log in. And, you know, me and you use the same <laughs> They're not going to be able to get their jobs in the morning, are they? I mean, I have a couple people that are just like technologically just disadvantaged people and they have to work in teams. They wouldn't be able to get a job with us now under the circumstances like they wouldn't even get they wouldn't even be able to do it um you know so i don't you know yeah i think it's going to change what our workforce looks like and who can apply it's gonna it's gonna make it harder for some people to get jobs but those people are going to have to adapt the skill sets that you're going to need even in a job like you know what we would consider entry-level workforce right like you know uh fast food service work um you know hotel hospitality your technology skills are going to have to increase. The workforce is going to be, you know, more tech savvy in the next, I don't know, it's started quick. I think I would have said five years, but now I'm going to say five weeks. You better, you better pick up your game. It's uh, it's going to be a different, it's going to be a different world. And the technology is pushed uh, basically everybody in the organization needs to be able to, to, to function on a, on a mobile device and, be able to to do basic uh, activities. Yeah, the paper's gone away. Yeah, I think we're we're talking about that a lot within, you know, within when we're talking about made central development. Do we need you know uh, an app like you know like a client side app for the device? Would it be you know more stable versus web based, and would it make it easier for people to use and things like that? We're having those conversations about making the technology easier for people, um, but I mean web based. You know, web-based tools, things like that. I think most people are are pretty confident, comfortable with. Um, it's just there is probably ten or twenty percent of the population that's going to be, you know, a little bit more challenged by that. Um, my wife has more soft skills, like she's like a human resources person, like in person, but like, you know, like her computer skills, you know, like you know, she 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 passes that on to one of our managers, but she's great one on one with people, but. You know, those skills are, you know, she's, I've just been impressed with her, like watching her, like learning all this technology because she never wanted to learn it before. But now with teaching the kids like schoolwork stuff, man, she's like doing Google meets with the kids, teachers and stuff that I wouldn't have counted on her to do. So I would have, I, I would say if she can pick it up, she doesn't even like to, to get on Facebook. If she, she doesn't even want to like log on onto her phone, she wants a flip phone. She doesn't even want a, an iPhone. So if she, if my wife can pick that stuff up, She's like totally hates technology, thinks it's, you know, very anti-personal and just doesn't like it. Um, then everyone's going to probably be able to figure it out because, you know, four weeks ago, I would have said she wouldn't be able to figure out all this stuff that she had to do for school. But she's very capable. She just, she just, she just likes putting that off on all the managers, um, you know, like, hey, do this for me, do this for me, print this, do this. 
and now she's figuring all that stuff on her own. So I think everyone's going to figure it out. I know we're pushing up against five. Do you have anything else you want to cover? Uh, we've got about five minutes. Um, I'll just show everybody where cleaning business today is. If you haven't uh, subscribed over here on the right, really easy. Just your email address, your first name, last name. Hit the subscribe button, and you'll get updates on you know all our new articles, and you'll be getting our newsletter and our super secret for smart uh, business moves uh, participants link is coronavirus dash downloads and uh, post that here in the chat and some of the more recent uh, posts that we have here um, this was a really cool article that we uh, went over yesterday this was uh, out of a Salt Lake City newspaper but uh, went through a lot of different situations that we uh, either run into or might be contemplating how do we deal with buses and bars and airplanes and choirs and church and so forth and explains the risks and has data behind it. It's uh, it's really a cool article. And um, this was what Matt was, was referencing earlier. We talked about this a bit yesterday, but it's really important to us. The CDC came back out and I guess they did this a couple of days ago to refine you know, their position where, yeah, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus spreads a lot. You know, the, big, the biggest risk of spread is through airborne droplets where you're in close contact with somebody who has the virus for a long period of time. But that certainly isn't the only way. And high touch surfaces and hand washing and all of that still a very important and necessary part of, of staying safe and keeping us safe. So I think that they made some statements and the press picked up on it that kind of implied that, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the work that we do in terms of hygienic cleaning might not be as important as it really is. So the CDC wanted to, to set that right now. I thought that was an important clarification that everyone should get because I, I want to make sure I was actually going to push this out to our customers because I, I think there's probably some that got the news blip over the weekend and then oh well they, they don't clear they don't actually the news doesn't ever come back and clarify when they like tell some big story like that they don't ever come back and clarify like oh wait you know that changed um, so yeah that, that I think this is a good thing to make sure you have in your education arsenal um, I posted this link on my Google My Business page, but I'm going to put it on my blog as well. Um, and that's a whole other topic. But do do post on your Google My Business page to keep it relevant. So the other thing going on is a PHC class. We've been working diligently. We've got several classes going in parallel now in terms of development. You're going to see a lot of that coming out here over the next few days. Um, science will we'll probably uh, be wrapping that up uh, tomorrow. The whole the whole chemistry and physics of of, of cleaning. Um, it's an awesome it's an awesome class out of a, out of an awesome program. Matt, I know that uh, you uh, you just uh, finished shooting class six, correct? Yeah, I did sort of the what to do procedures, methods, productivity. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to put like all my new hires and really put my staff through this course as well. I mean, I, I'm I'm happy to eat my own cooking on this. I think this is going to make my staff just next level as we as we kind of grow into the future. I think I think we've always we've always had kind of low expectations of what our staff can know and understand and what they what they should know and understand. I think we have to raise the bar and we have to invest in education. And I think this is a very I think it's a very important class, very low cost, and very very good entry point for for them. For, for cleaning technicians, for cleaning professionals, people who are cleaning homes every day, that's what this class is designed for. Yeah. Not to say if you're a cleaning business owner, you wouldn't benefit from this. You would, but the audience is the people <coughs> that are that are cleaning homes every day. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I try, and you know, like you know, when we got into productivity, I tried to be very agnostic. So if you do things a certain way, we might have talked about 
like, you know, left to right, top, you know, top to bottom, left to right, or, you know, aprons versus caddies, but we don't, we don't prescribe anything in there. Um, you know, different ways to do things. I think we're, we're, we're trying to cover what some best practices are as far as, you know, you know, avoiding your cleaning technician spraying directly on glass and doing some damage to, to, you know, homes, things that are, you know, common knowledge and what to do. But the man, I was looking at the science stuff today with, um, uh, with, with Tom and, and Liz and uh, Janice, and I guess Joe's on the call a little bit too, or Joe's on the call for most of the call. And um, dude, Janice knows more stuff about cleaning than I, than I've ever known. And, but she's, she's really breaking it down in a way that I think is important for staff to understand. Um, it's going to be, I think it's going to save you money on surfaces and damage. And um, I think there's a lot of potential that it pays itself back in a lot of ways. Robin's asking if it's in Spanish. No, not at the moment. I don't speak uh, I'm sorry. I don't speak Spanish yet. No, sorry. At the moment, I'm sorry. It's not, but, uh, we, we can, we're looking into to ways where we can actually get the, the PowerPoint decks uh, converted in Spanish, or at the very least do uh, do subtitles. So yes. we're looking for some options, but. To be honest, we started this because we saw that there was an opportunity that I think everybody needed more education and we wanted to get this done quickly. This is probably version A of like, of a five year project that's gonna get better and better and better and, and slicker and cleaner and maybe even, you know, easier to use and web-based all in the future. But this is like version A, just to step your game up now. And, you know, I hope we can have all those things in the next yeah. couple of years. In five years from now, you'll be wearing your glasses that you can actually see the content there while you're cleaning and right. really augmented with artificial intelligence and virtual reality. And yeah, someone was asking what the robot will be doing some of it. In, in, <laughs> Big plans. Yeah, someone was asking where the business is going to be in 15 years, where our industry is going to be in 15 years. I'm like, man, it's hard to see in the next five months the way things have been. But, you know, things have changed so much in, you know, I started making some preparations for this in February and people were thinking I was crazy. My st I still think like my, my American Express bill for February was like 30 or $36,000. Cause I was buying everything I needed for like a year. And my, my stock room is full of everything we need to get through the next year. Cause I was afraid that supply chains were going to be cut off and that whatever, I didn't really anticipate that we weren't going to be cleaning for a month that I did that I couldn't foresee, but uh, yeah. Matt, thank you for helping us out today for, yeah. for, for, for joining us. It was awesome. We yeah, had we a good should. time. I, this was fun. Thank you everybody for being with us. We'll, uh, going to wrap this up. We're against the hour, but we'll be back uh, tomorrow at five o'clock Eastern. You guys take care. Awesome.